I am so delighted to be with you today and very honored to be the, the speaker to start us off. Um, and uh, <laughs> Omid actually talked about, you know, the interesting um, ideas we might have about economics. And so I want to hear from the people in this group how many of you have taken an economics class at some point in your life. The one quote you might remember from the founding father of economics, Adam Smith, was that it is not from the benevolence. By here we mean benevolence like Omid's uh, beautiful orientation towards the beggars on the street. It's not from the benevolence of the baker or the butcher that we get our bread or our meat, um, but from their regard to their self-interest. And that is what we address ourselves to. In order to get our needs met in society, we must address ourselves to the self-interest of those. Now that, as the foundation of the market economy, through which the individual hand creates surplus, um, has created a kind of, not just a descriptive essence, but almost a normative essence of what we think um, people should be motivated by, because it creates the greatest good in society. So there are many um, economics professors who are very worried that at the end of the course they come and the, and the students say, you know, but I thought it was the rational thing to do to be self-interested or even more to be greedy. The irony of all of this is that while that's the quote that everyone remembers from Adam Smith, from The Wealth of Nations, he actually started his second book, um, called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, that he was writing at the same time as The Wealth of Nations, with the following quote. So we address ourselves not to their humanity. So make sure you don't address yourself to the humanity of merchants, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of our own necessities, but of their advantages. And yet, the, the, the same Adam Smith started his second book with the following quote. How selfish soever a man may be, there are some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him, necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. The greatest <coughs> ruffian, the most hardened violator of society, is not without it. So what is this natural principle that all of us are actually imbued with? The interesting thing is over the past 30 years within economics, there has been growing evidence within the field of behavioral economics through game theory and experiments that in fact, we have this intrinsic natural principle showing how necessary others' well-being is to us. So through many types of lab experiments and games, people are quite willing to give up a lot of money in order to make other people happy just for the pleasure of it. So then the natural question becomes, if that is a, is a principle in our nature, something that renders others' well-being necessary to us, what do we create in the market that could actually speak to that? And in particular, is there a way you could incentivize economic activity through leveraging existing social and altruistic motivation. Not through harassing people for their altruism, but through harnessing it. And how do we actually test that in the field? Not just in controlled lab experiments, but actually where people are competing with all kinds of other interests. And then even deeper, so I'm gonna to talk to you about field experiments that we've done <coughs> in this. Um, and really trying to think about that. And I'm gonna challenge you to think about how you could do this within your organizations. And in all the activities you take place as the economic and social agents that you are in the world. But then to go one step deeper and say, could we actually build, not just harness, not just leverage, but actually build altruistic motivation as a capacity to serve others through the exact way that our work uh, our jobs and our work environment are designed. Okay, so the first part of this, the field data, takes us all the way to Zambia, which is a country I've been working in for the last 15 years. And we had a challenge there, working with a public health organization. This is uh, a female condom. It is 
one of the only ways at this time in a country with a very high rate of HIV that women could protect themselves against HIV. But like many new technologies, it has a fundamental difficulty, which is that people have to figure out, first they have to trust that this is something that would work. They have to figure out how to use it. It's not easy to use at the beginning. You have to like ask a few times. It's important to have it in an environment that's easily accessible and trusted. The question is, where is that? And it turns out that this public health organization um, drew inspiration from Brazil and Zimbabwe where uh, they look to hairdressers and barbers, which unlike you know, the way we think about salons here, these are on every street, everyone who's been in Africa knows they're on every street corner, and people gather there. So even in our baseline surveys, there were something like 30% of people had already talked about HIV AIDS with their hairdresser or barber. So then the next question became, if these are gonna be our dis innovative distribution channel for this new technology, what is the best way to incentivize these hairdressers and barbers? How do we think of them? Should we think of them as social volunteers out with the mission of the country to promote uh, female condoms and prevent HIV? Should we think of them as standard distributors and give them a financial incentive? And actually, this organization was based on private sector motives, so they had a motto that said, no margin, no mission. That's what we ended up calling the paper. Because the idea was, if you didn't give a financial margin to people, they don't have a mission. Or could we design another type of incentive that actually uses the same principles of financial margins that we have in the private sector, but actually connects people to the social impact they're having? And then how do we test which one is better? So we talked with, we designed these different types of incentives, talking with the hairdressers and barbers that were going to become part of our study. And um, we implemented, uh, together with this organization, a large-scale field experiment. So what you'll see in all of these studies are um, what we call field experiments, which are basically randomized controlled trials, the way they use in medicine, but in the field. So that you can be sure that actually the, the effects you're seeing are not because of a whole bunch of other factors that usually confound, but because of the actual intervention that we're doing. Um, and by the way, the reason we do that a lot of times for me is because I'm often in the situation as an economist in the field to have to show the effects of something that many people dismiss as very fuzzy. And so we want to show the most rigor that we can. Okay, so what do we do? We census all of the salons in Lusaka, which is like 20, 2,500 of them. We randomly assign 1,200 of these to four different treatment groups. Um, which are the things that I mentioned in terms of different models of motivation. So there's a 10% financial margin, a 90% financial margin on the product, pure volunteer and non-monetary rewards. And here's some of the barbers and hairdressers who were in our study. This is the city of Lusaka. You can't really see it, but that's how we, we basically geocoded the whole city and then created grids so that, um, so that we could think about you know, clustering people and put the, the different treatment groups in them because actually it's really hard to do these kinds of experiments because people will get upset if, if somebody's getting something and they're not. So we created some distance between them. Um, and then we had to design the non-financial incentive. So what we tried to think about is what is so brilliant about financial margins in the for-profit world? What does it do? It connects the employee with their, their what we might call their marginal effort, so that if I as an employee am thinking I'm gonna work an extra hour, it gives me a chance to connect to the extra profits that creates for my employer, right? So I get some percentage of that profit. We wanted to think about what is that like for something that creates a social benefit. So we just made something symbolic, and, and you know, we, this was our first attempt at it, which was just that every time you sold a female condom, you got a star. And this was a thermometer you could put up at your salon. And, um, and basically, the stars accumulated, and this was your contribution to community health. It was purely symbolic. Um, and what the hairdressers and barbers told us is some of them had it up in their salons, and they were proud of it. A lot of them would just look at it, and they would look at it, and they would feel proud of it. They would feel both their own progress towards their goal, but especially this feeling of connection to the community impact they were having. And so as I mentioned, we did all of these, and then we can look at the results. We then follow people for um, a year, and we use their actual sales data um, and their inventory stock to look at which types of margins actually create the biggest uh, volume of sales. 
And this is what we found, is that the stars were twice as effective as the highest financial margin, as the 90% financial margin. Now, that doesn't mean that money doesn't work. It just means that in this environment, even providing 90% financial margins was not as valuable to these hairdressers and barbers than this feeling of connection to the social impact that they were creating. What's really interesting here is that prior to starting this experiment, we did a, a type of game with them, a donation game, like the ones that many have done in, in economics. Called, it's called a dictator game or an altruism game, where we gave them some amount of money and we said some of this you could donate to a local HIV charity to get their sense of baseline altruism. And, and so what we know is from that level, who gave little and who gave a lot. So just like, what's your starting level of altruism, basically? That's kind of what we wanted to start with. And so we, have, we can put people into the kind of low donation and high donation types of categories. And what you can see, this is the volunteer treatment, which is like kind of like our control treatment, is that it's, as you might expect, the people who gave more at the beginning, because they're more altruistic, are actually better at selling female condoms. They, they do feel more committed to it. So they're all, you know, they, they do do better in terms of how many condoms they are able to, to sell and promote. But um, the stars actually um, allow, at every level of altruism, an increase. So they basically leverage any existing level of, of altruism and take it to that next level. And that's part of what made us start thinking about the idea that every person, wherever you start, um, has this pro-social motivation. This pro-social motivation can be a source of value for the organization. And at whatever level someone starts, this source, this source of value, this source of motivation can be leveraged. And when you leverage it, you create greater and greater actions to build what we call altruistic capital. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that is in a second. But importantly, and contrary to a lot of what uh, people's intuition said, financial incentives as well don't actually have to crowd it out. So in fact, um, the highest financial margins, although they were not as effective at, at the stars, they actually helped the people who were very altruistic to feel even more committed. So that kind of made us think maybe you know, financial incentives and pro-social incentives are not at odds with each other. You can help to promote this. So that's what started us thinking about altruistic capital. And at the time, um, the uh, Ministry of Health in Zambia had heard about this project. And the director of research asked me to come in and say, you know what? We're actually starting a new program of community health workers that are going to be full time. We've heard that you've had really great success in um, motivating uh, people to promote HIV prevention through non-financial incentives. We actually don't have a lot of money to give to these community health workers. Can you design non-financial incentives like the STARS for these community health workers? And that was a moment where we had to think, actually, no. Like this, you know, there's so much that's different about this other setting because What's crucial is, again, these were just like part-time. This was their part-time job. They had another job that was giving them money. So it's not that the stars would actually give you actual money. And so we started to work with the Ministry of Health to say, all right, how do we understand altruistic motivation in the context of a full-time job in which you might have other needs that you have to fulfill? And how do we find the best people for those jobs? So that's what led us to the next experiment. And let me just put it in context for you. This is how, how problematic it is. So like everywhere in the world, Zambia faces this human resource crisis in health. And the crisis comes from the following fact. This is a map of the world that is weighed by the disease burden in the world. So this is malaria. You can think about it with infant deaths or HIV. You can see where the disease burden is greatest. So you see where North America is, you see where Europe is, this is Africa. This is a map of the world weighed by the number of nurses. And it's even worse for physicians. So you can see that exactly where the greatest disease burden are is where the smallest, the fewest numbers of health workers are. So in Zambia, when we started, there were 11 million people, 646 doctors, most of them in Lusaka. So getting health services to remote areas is one of the most difficult problems 
everywhere in the developing world. And this program was started to, to solve this problem by basically um, starting at the community level, finding people who were committed to the community and could deliver community health services and upskilling them. And so when we asked the Minister of Health, what are you most worried about in this program? He said, we have to professionalize this sector. We can't have them just be volunteers and just doing willy-nilly health services. But our fear is that once we professionalize them, they will just become motivated by money and by career, and they will lose their connection to the community. So that's what we're most worried about. So we said, OK, great. So let's design something together that would help us generate knowledge together about what the best kind of way is to recruit the optimal kind of person to provide this health services. So together, we designed two different kinds of recruitment posters. In one poster, we emphasized serving the community and becoming a community health worker. And we emphasized all the benefits that can come from that. In the second one, we emphasized the aspect of boosting your skills and boosting your career. And then we took the 48 districts across the country who were going to be part of the first part of the, the wave of recruitment and randomized these posters across the districts. But because this was a, a true exercise in the co-generation of knowledge, so I don't believe that knowledge is the domain of academics, by the way, even though I'm up here. I, I really think that it's not like we generate knowledge, then we bring it and apply it somewhere. I think we have everyone's generating knowledge all the time. And what we wanted to do here was to generate knowledge together. So I brought these posters to everyone in the Ministry of Health and said, which one do you think is going to bring in the best person? We don't actually know. And now I can ask you the question. And I might have set you up for something because I told you the previous experiment. But that's why it's very interesting. We were also set up that way. How many of you guys think the, the poster on the left would bring in the best kind of person for both health services and health impact? How many of you say the poster on the right on the career promotion? Okay, so here were our results. Let me just say one thing. Um, we, once we recruited everyone, they then spent a year together from, from both of these different kinds of recruitment processes. And while they were on the job, they had all the same incentives. So the, the thing you're going to see is really about the type of person who comes in, not about the incentives they face on the job. Here it is. The poster on the right brought in people who did 30% more household visits. Now, doing a household visit in these remote areas is not easy. You have to go like hours to find a home. And so you might think, OK, well, maybe they did a lot more visits, but they did it at the expense of 100 other things. By the way, not only, I mean, these visits, 30% more visits over the 18-month period in which we're tracking them turns into 20,000 more visits. But not only that, they did twice as many community mobilization meetings. It wasn't that they like went to the easiest person. As soon as they got to the nearest house, they just talked to the head of the household. No, they went to the women. They went to the children. They didn't shirk on going in after hours emergencies or weekends. And crucially, they actually stayed in their jobs. They're still in there five years later. One of my research assistants just came back from the field. And they're still highly committed, which was very much against what, what a lot of the policymakers in Lusaka thought, because they said, you know, as soon as we give them an option of advancing their career, they're going to want to get out of there. But actually, what it turned out was that this career poster found the people who were really talented in their communities and wanted their own personal flourishing, but actually wanted to stay in their communities. We then, um, two years later, did a um, very large household survey of representative households at random. We weighed the children to see um, the true health impacts. And we got all the data from the health clinics and hospitals nearby. And what we found is that those who were recruited with the career poster in those areas they had institutional deliveries. That means women delivering children in clinics go up by 31%. This is a really hard indicator to change in a country where 1 in 27 women die in childbirth over their lifetime. The under 1-year-olds receiving polio vaccination goes up by 20%. When we weighed the children, the share of underweight goes down by 25%. So now what is happening here, especially given the previous 
study I just told you about. And given my whole desire to motivate people from altruistic motivation, when in fact, recruiting them from career posters is giving these kinds of health impacts. Here was what we really had to confront. Here it is. Just like we figured out in the hairdressers, people have all kinds of varying levels of beginning social motivation or altruistic motivation, right? Some people have a full heart and want to give to every beggar they see. Some people could care less. And <clears throat> it's true that when you provide low rewards on the job, you actually, no one else would do it unless they really were committed to that cause. So that kind of common intuition that people have, that you know, if we increase the rewards, we're gonna get in more people who just don't care, they're only there for the money, is true. That is there, that happens. The thing is, we don't just care about their heart. We also care, so that's what material benefits go in the opposite direction. Right? You can bring in people that are only there for, for, uh, for the material benefits. But we also care about people's ability and their heads, right? We care about how good they're gonna be at this job. And there, material benefits go in the opposite direction. So if you only provide low rewards on a job, you're only bringing in people who might not have any other good option, right? As you start to increase the material rewards on a job, you bring in people who have greater and greater talent and better and better outside options. And so the highest rewards will bring in those, those kinds of people with great skills. And so material benefits go in the opposite direction. So what happens when you want both things? You want both the head and the heart of someone, and you want the person with the full head and the full heart. What does that mean about how you should provide material benefits? The way to think about it is that these are all the possible applicants that you could possibly bring in, so every combination of head and heart that you can imagine, with low rewards, that if you just provide low rewards, you're gonna bring in people that have kind of what we might call low talent, not a great outside option, but they really care a lot, you know? As you increase the rewards, you're gonna have more and more people applying, some of whom have better outside options, some of whom really could care less about the social cause. And, you know, as you bring in the highest rewards, you bring in all kinds of people. Now then the question is, now you brought all those people, who would you choose? These are the people who apply, but you get to choose. And of course, you would choose that guy, right? The one that has, or that woman who has the highest, the, the sort of fullest ability and the, the biggest heart. It doesn't really matter that those people have applied if you get to choose that person. So that's why the common intuition that a lot of policymakers have that we should keep salaries low for teachers and doctors that I hear all the time in developing countries because that's gonna bring in the people who are most committed to the cause is not quite right because it's also not allowing us to bring in the people that might have other outside options. But when we do this, we're able to find those people. In fact, those people find us and they come into the job. And in our case, it brings in people with more skills, the same level of pro-sociality, a great commitment to communities and health impact that are bigger than we found in, in many, many other types of health interventions. So this had to have us take one step back and go one step deeper into the simplistic notion of what motivates humanity and how we leverage that for economic activity. Because we're obviously motivated by both things. We need both our individual flourishing and our ability to contribute to others. And these two sources of motivation don't have to be in conflict. In fact, part of how we might wanna think about designing work is to be able to bring these two sources together. Um, and the other thing is, one other thing that brought us to, where, as we thought about why did, were hairdressers motivated in a slightly different way than these community health workers, is just to think about what is scarce in your environment and what is abundant in your environment. So for the hairdressers and barbers, no one had ever approached them to say, you know what, you could create social impact. But there were a hundred ways in which they could create an extra buck, right? They, had, they were selling wigs, they were selling shampoos, et cetera. And so they had lots of ways to do that. They had very few ways in which they could make social impact. The people in these communities had lots and lots of ways, in fact, they were always being addressed to serve their community. They had very few ways to address their own need for career development and, and individual flourishing. So when we thought about that, we thought, okay, well, where in our work environment is the ability to create social impact the scarcest? And that's when we thought, is it possible that actually 
altruistic capital could be greatest leveraged, not just in the social sector, but in the private sector. And where would be the worst place, the place where it might be scarcest to find altruistic capital and to leverage it? Would be potentially in the banking sector. <laughs> the irony of that is that actually, banking tremendously affects social welfare by allowing us to allocate credit to productive activities, right? But bankers are so often not connected to that impact that they're having, and they're not able to internalize that impact on society, which is why the financial crisis was such a big wake-up point for all of, of, of banking. So the first thing we wanted to do, just to start this process of thinking, how would we leverage this within the banking sector, was to partner with a very major global bank and collect measures of how bankers perceive their own social impact on society and the way in which they're valued by society. And so this is, um, this will show you, it's hard to see, but this shows you around the world, um, this measure, which is like, how much do you perceive your impact on society and, and how much do you perceive that society values your impact compared to other jobs. Okay, so pro-social jobs where this has been done by Adam Grant, who's at Wharton, in teachers, firefighters, et cetera. Turns out, so let me just show you, uh, this is Great Britain and Ireland. I mean, banking is, is slightly less than pro-social jobs, say, in Ireland, but not that much less. In the US, it's the same. They believe they bring the same social impact. But social value is much less. So this is Great Britain. You're, how much do you believe that you're valued by society? In Great Britain, it's much less than um, the pro-social jobs. Now, the interesting thing is, I'm going to show you this. This shows you the correlation. This is just a correlation. It's not causation. It's not a field experiment. Okay? But it shows you the correlation between your beliefs about your social impact, your beliefs about your value in society, and your productivity on the job. So things like how good are you at um, your performance, as well as living the values of the organization. These are all your supervisor performance scores. And even how good are you at screening? So what we call the, uh, an altruistic activity is to screen for financial crime or trafficking, for example, that the money could be used for, they are much better the more they believe that they could have social impact um, and social value. So this idea started us thinking that there could be a virtuous cycle <coughs> between, so this is just perceived social impact. Obviously, you'd want people to be connected to true social impact. But that could create a, a virtuous cycle between how connected you feel to the social impact that you could have and your productivity on the job and how much you're serving people. And then that could help to create more of a sense of social contribution and would give a great incentive for organizations and companies to actually invest in helping their employees develop this. And, uh, and, and so that is kind of what led us finally to formulate this idea more formally of altruistic capital and the kind of last piece that I'm going to leave you with and the challenge that I'm going to leave you with for thinking about your organizations. So as we started to think about what is this, is it just motivation that we were seeing in these different studies? Or is there more than that? We realized that you know, in the formulation in economics or in business, often we think about altruism as a preference, as a motivation. But what if it's not that? What if it's a capacity? What if it's a skill? A skill like any other skill that we learn how to do. And we learn to do better by doing the same way that so much of religion and virtue ethics has told us that we become what we repeatedly do. And that neuroscience has told us that the, the, the neurons that fire together wire together. That it's just by doing these activities that we become more altruistic. Um, and that is what creates the capital. So just like Solo has talked about with other forms of capital, financial capital, human capital, capital is something that is costly to invest in. But as you invest in it, it creates present benefit, uh, future benefits that make it easier and easier to do. And like other forms of capital, it can be accumulated and it can be depleted. The important part is that there's a point at which um, organizations could invest to help people incentivize and get them on the path of accumulation. And that investment, as so we have this like nice drawing, if you start here, you know, and you're down in this kind of like part where the altruistic motivation, your altruistic capital stock is really small to start with. You might need a lot to get you up here. But here is this area, by the way, this is like a regular economic growth path where you've got 
poverty traps models here. But this, the idea here is you've got increasing returns here, right? There's like a lot of high returns to you pushing up this path, but it's also not so easy. You need a big push. Because for example, if you're in the kind of business where uh, everyone else is pretty selfish, and then the business starts to put in um, incentives for you to volunteer and do pro-social work, but everyone else is pretty selfish and you, that's really what you get rewarded for. You might start up this path, but then you're constantly being brought down. But then the idea is, if you can get on this path and go past this point, then it actually becomes easier and easier. You're on this other equilibrium, basically. And that just feeds itself. So just like in economics, we have a poverty trap. You could have an altruistic capital trap, basically. But that may also means that when you get up there, you'll have a lot more and it'll be easier to get. But it, it really does make us think differently about how we understand altruism in industries, in sectors, and in society. It means that you know, if we want to change the culture within an organization, we don't just have to you know, just change everyone in it and just bring in other nice people. And there isn't even this idea that there are like the good people and the bad people. It's more this idea that actually, if you have accumulable altruistic capital, then firms can provide incentives for its accumulation. And then, you know, we need to, part of what we're doing now is building a whole bunch of field experiments within firms to try to understand what the path of accumulation really looks like and what are the mechanisms. And this is part of what I want you to be thinking about in your organizations, is how are you helping employees to facilitate the accumulation of their own altruistic capital? And what mechanisms does it help? Does, does that process take? So one of the things can be, you know, through habit formation, just like, you know, you learn, you know, exercise over time. As beginning, it's kind of hard, but then you just kind of get hooked on it. Maybe there's something similar. Or maybe it's the case that actually we have a lot of evidence from psychology that people underestimate how much they actually enjoy serving others. If that's the case, then you just need to experiment a little bit and you learn that actually I like to do that. Um, and you may also learn that other people around you are not as selfish as you thought. And actually, they also would like to serve, but they feel like they shouldn't. And so this kind of becomes a social multiplier effect. And then there's another piece that's really interesting, which is that it, it makes you more aware of other opportunities to serve. So one time, it becomes like in your mind, it becomes more and more refined in terms of seeking opportunities where you can be of contribution to others. That's a path that I'm really interested in like exploring. But the thing is that it can also deplete. And that's the second thing that I'd like you to think about, is whether in your life or in your organizations, are there things that are happening that deplete the altruistic capital of yourself or others around you? One of the ways that we know from psychology is that if you feel a dissonance between the stated values that someone is saying or your organization is saying and what is actually happening, that is one of the surest ways to deplete. Obviously, as we think about the world of work, and particularly if we, if we take on this notion that our character and our preferences are formed by our repeated actions, where do we spend the majority of our time doing repeated actions? It's at work. So this creates a fundamental, vital importance of how our work cultures um, facilitate our own character. Um, and so it's not a surprise that there's a really strong demand. This is not an indulgent thing to demand that your work creates meaning for you. It's an understanding of you taking uh, control over who you want to become. And I, I, I just want to go back to this idea of how we orient towards work in society and what matters to us. And I'll tell you the, the kind of inspiration for all of this work for me has been this, this quote from the Baha'i writings, that all work done in the spirit of service is a form of worship. So if we think about orienting all of our work towards service and creating almost this devotional atmosphere at work, that's maybe the third challenge. That's along the lines of accumulating altruistic capital, but taking it one step further. So one of my favorite poets, Khalil Gibran, says, what is it to work with love? It's to weave the cloth with threads drawn from your heart, even as if your beloved were to wear that cloth. Work is love made visible. Now, this is where we get to be different from other business conferences. What is it to work with love and devotion? 
What that tells you is that it's not just the work that you're doing. It is everything you do on your way to work, in the tube, in your family, in, your, in every single part of your environment. And that's why altruistic capital is quite different from the movement in effective altruism or other things that talk about altruism as something that is done to others, that is financial capital that's given to philanthropy, for example. Altruistic capital you can accumulate through every domain of your life. This isn't just the actions you do at work. This, isn't, this is about you as a human being and every domain in which you could find opportunities to serve others. With your family, with your coworkers, in your community, in your investments, in your personal relationship and volunteering and business operations, there's so many more. And all of them allow you to continue to accumulate. And so as you think about your lifetime, as you think about this day and tomorrow and then next year and then 10 years from now, I think taking control over how your altruistic capital is accumulating. What are the processes in which you're becoming bigger or smaller <laughs> over periods of time is kind of crucial. And, and then I want to leave you with one last thought, which um, is a little bit like just to take a step back and say, what is altruism overall? Because as we think about what does it mean to take altruistic action in all of our different domains, we have to think about what does it mean to take altruism? Right? What, what does that even mean, actually, when we have to think about it? And you know, I went back to look at where altruism comes from. And it's a, a relatively recent word, actually, just mid-19th century. And it comes from the idea of thinking about the other, okay? giving to the other. And obviously, as we think about family and personal relationships and work colleagues and everything, we always think about the other and how I can, me as a self can give to the other. But I want to leave you with a provocative thought which is, what if the truest form of altruism is not actually what I give to others, but that you melt the distinction between self and other? And I think just taking us into that realm to understand how fundamental to our humanity is this need and desire to feel connected and not distinct from the other. I'll leave you with one experiment that was done that um, randomized whether people felt personally excluded from an activity. And then they, they looked at people's brains. They did fMRI scans to look at people's brains. And what they found was that when you feel excluded, like the other, your brain lights up in exactly the same way as when you feel physical pain. That's how hardwired we are to need to feel connected, to belong, to feel part of one system. And so I, I just want to leave us with this idea that as we think about how we build altruistic capital in ourselves, in the people around us, through our, the way we design work and environment. Let's try to go even beyond the idea of altruism as something we give to others, but rather a very deep concept of how interconnected we belong to others, and just see what creative pathways open up to us from that. Thank you.